All right. Do you want to Good stuff yet? Cue us up. We are here with Beckett Cook. Beckett, thanks for being on the podcast. We're like talking digitally, but literally about ten miles away from each other. So, I know. This, you know, this is kind of I think the first time I've been on a show that's been with in Los Angeles. Within we're both we're all three in Los Angeles, so that's cool. We should have planned this better. We should have had you come over here to our fancy studio. Yeah, I know. Yeah, as you can tell, it's really fancy. So we've got all the great, which also happens to be the. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Parents lounge. The parents lounge like of the our church. Mother's room <laughs> in our church is our podcast studio. Oh, day. nice. So you know, <laughs> this is our parents headquarters. Lounge. We're crushing it. Nice. There's literally a diaper changing table right there. <laughs> so you know, you guys are on your way. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, definitely we are. Definitely. Um. So I guess let's start off. How did how did we hear first hear about um. Beckett and yep. like talk us through that. I first heard about Beckett uh, through uh, an article online where you were sharing your story of coming to Christ um, and you were uh, a practicing homosexual. And so obviously that piqued my interest, um, especially as a young pastor dealing with uh, all kinds of questions around sexuality, um, which seems like is quite a popular topic now for Very any popular. pastor to have to yeah, to walk through, not even just in, I think, major cities like LA, but uh, in all kinds of places. So uh, I became aware of your story through that. And then uh, I think it's probably just through God's providence recently that popped back into my head. I was like, oh, we should reach out to this guy and have him come on our podcast and share his story. And um, so, yeah, we're honored to have you on here, man. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm glad you guys reached out. It's Absolutely. good to be here. I definitely, uh, I connect on the vast podcast. Story. On, on the vast, vast podcast, the vast it's podcast. so vast. Yes. I love it. It it's yeah. very vast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere we won't go. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Obviously, if you have me on, if you're having me on your show, <laughs> there are definitely nowhere you won't go. <laughs> so I connected uh, kind of personally to your story because of uh, the geography. Um, you you got invited to church at what was like my favorite coffee shop at the time. So anyway, uh, Becca, would you uh, kick us off just by sharing uh, some of your story? your background and how you came to Christ. Yeah. So I grew up in Dallas, Texas. I was the youngest of eight kids. I knew at a very young age that I was attracted to the same sex. And of course, back in those days, back in ancient, ancient Rome, it was very much taboo to be gay. So in da especially in Dallas, and <clears throat> I grew up in a Roman Catholic family. So I kind of le led this double life sort of like internally, I knew I was attracted to the same sex, but at school, at elementary school and high school, I, you know, I went steady with girls and I, um, uh, so I, and I was, you know, I was very popular, but, but I had this like dark, deep, dark secret. I couldn't tell anyone. And so it was this weird sort of almost schizophrenia of like, okay, I have to live this one life this way and another life completely quietly and privately and not tell anyone because I'll be completely ostracized. And so in high school, though, at Jesuit in Dallas, I ended up becoming best friends with someone who was dealing with the same thing. So we became best friends, came out to each other at the Stark Club in Dallas and, and wow. um, 1985, I think. What's the start? Uh, I was like 14 years old. I mean, it was crazy. Like we were, so we came out to each other and we were going to gay bars. We were going to you know, Cedars on Cedar Springs in Cedar Springs. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very young. He was younger. He was a year younger. And I don't even know how we got into these clubs. <laughs> we looked like we were, say, you, wait, you were 14 and 13. <laughs> no. Yeah. We were like, I was 14, 15 and 14, really. Wow. And you know, like we went to the start club and they immediately put us on the guest list. Like we were, cause I don't know. It was just the craziest thing. And so we, is, what is the start club? Is that like a famous gay bar and star club Dallas is not or? a gay bar. It's, it was designed by Philippe Stark, the French designer, um, hmm. famous, very, very famous French designer that you should know about. If you don't know, I, I, don't know. I, I only read the Bible. Oh. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and so the Stark. Was owned kind of like by Grace Jones and Stevie Nicks and like a couple, a few other people, but they were investors in it. Anyway, I remember walking into the Star Club with my best friend, like the first time, and there were straight people, gay people. They were like dra what we called back then drag queens. And we walked in and we were like, whoa. And I was like, 
wow, these are my people. These, I feel at home now, finally. Like, I finally found my people. Because I never felt quite at home uh, with my friends in, in high school because they didn't really know who I, you know, who I was or what I was dealing with. So I kind of, mm-hmm. even though I was good friends with a lot of people in high school, I always felt slightly alienated because I didn't, they didn't really know me. And so the start club was kind of like, okay, these people <laughs> get who I am. These are like the misfits of society. And they're also like insane, like an amazing people. And they're all artists. And, and so that was a huge turning point for me because being able to have a best friend I could confide in and go explore gay culture with. And I, you know, I was very precocious. Uh, and because again, I was the youngest of eight kids, my parents were kind of uh, missing in action. <laughs> they just like couldn't be right. bothered. I was making the straight A's at Jesuit. And so they didn't care. They didn't even think about like where I was yeah. at five in the morning. They didn't notice really. And so, mm. So I had uh, all this kind of uh, leeway or this room to kind of maneuver and do whatever I wanted. And so I, so yeah, we, and we went to gay bars and um, I, I experienced, you know, sexual activity with guys in high school. And, um, you know, I, I, so I, I started at a very young age and then, and then I went off to college. The same thing happened. I became best friends with someone in college who was dealing with the same thing. And then again, we like explored gay life together. We, we confided, you go to college? We confided in each other and we were still in the closet. Like I, I never thought being gay was kind of like this lifelong thing. I didn't think it was like a permanent thing. I just thought, Oh, well, this is what I'm into now. And like, eventually Kind of like in the back of my mind, I was like, eventually I'll, you know, I'll figure, I'll figure this out and get married to a woman and have a family. Like, this is just like a kind of a phase, but, but not really, I'm not sure. So, so I was in the closet and, um, it wasn't until after college, I, I went to, to, I moved to Japan, to Tokyo with my best friend. And because we, we, we both were kind of like, what do we, we didn't know what we wanted to do with our lives. I was apply, I applied to law school and got in. I applied to dental school in Dallas and got in Baylor dental school. I got in. It's weird. I had all these kind of grad school options, but I was like, I don't know if I want to do any of this stuff. Like, so we moved to Tokyo to figure things out and as if that's going to help, but as um, you do, as you do, right. As you, you do, your, your you know, and, and we lived yeah. in Japan for a year and well, I lived there for a year. My friend ended up staying for five years, which is crazy, but we again in Japan in Tokyo, like being gay was super taboo. So like the gay bars were super underground. Um, but I, it was weird. I felt this sort of freedom that I had never felt before because I, it was so far away from home that I felt like kind of liberated because no one really, you know, no one I knew was there really in Japan. So, um, and then while we were living in Japan, in Shibuya, near Shibuya, in the middle of Tokyo, for his friend from Texas came to visit us. And that he was on the Christo exhibit, the artist, if you know, I don't know if you know Christo, but he's a French artist. And he and his wife used to like drape, they used to put fabric over like the Reichstag and like, they would put fabric over giant buildings and stuff like that was... <laughs> Okay. That was their You art. know, that kind of art, like conceptual. Okay. Um, yep. Christo, he, he recently died. Anyway, so this guy, we'll call him Adam. Adam came to visit us in Tokyo for because he was on the Christo exhibition. He was part of like helping put up these giant umbrellas. They, they, he did these umbrellas in all across California and Japan, these yellow umbrellas and blue umbrellas. And so uh, Adam was part of that whole project. And so he came and stayed with us for like five days. And by the time he left, we had fallen in love. And it was the Mm -hmm. first time I had fallen in love with a guy. And it was like, oh, my gosh, like, this is this is crazy. This is who I am. Like, this is. And that's when 
homosexuality as my identity became completely cemented. And I, uh, so Adam and I ended up dating. Well, I moved back to, to Texas, to Dallas after Tokyo. Uh, we, Adam and I dated for t- almost two years, kind of long distance. He was in Austin. I was in Dallas and it was, so it was very stressful, but, um, and then that fell apart and then I moved to Los Angeles. And so in 1993, okay. I moved to LA. And um, and at this time, at, at this point in time, had you come out to your family yet? Like, did they hmm. know that this was? Yeah, in Tokyo, it all happened in Tokyo because my my sister had written me a letter asking me if I was gay because she had had these. She suspected that I was, and I wrote her this really long letter back, and you know, an epistle to my sister, and um. And uh, I said, at the end of the letter, I said, please don't tell mom and dad because I'll, you know, I'll tell them when I get home. But of course, she, she immediately told my <laughs> entire family, which I kind of appreciated because it, she did all the heavy lifting for me. So by the time I got back from Tokyo, my, my whole family knew, my parents knew. And my parents were super lovely about it. They were so gracious. They, my parents were born again Christians and my, all my siblings were. Even It's a long story. I can't get into the whole Catholic thing, but there was a whole reformation in my family. Uh, but basically everyone was born again. All my, all my siblings, which is crazy. My seven siblings wow. and my parents who are in heaven right now are all very committed Christians. It's bizarre. Wow. It's like all 10 of us. And so mm. God had a huge amount That's of grace in my family. But um, my parents' reaction, my dad, my mother cried and I was like, mom, it's okay. Don't worry. This is just who I am. It's not a big deal. And then she was fine. And then my dad, you know, he came up to me and asked me, you know, did I do anything wrong as a father? Are you angry at me about X, Y, and Z? And I was like, dad, it's not your fault. This is just, this is just who I am, blah, blah, blah. So, but they were super sweet about it. Super loving super uh they i mean obviously they they believed it was wrong and they believed it was sinful for sure and all of my siblings did my siblings were a little more like more harsh on me than my parents my parents were just like we love you and like you know they 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 knew they couldn't really do anything about it you know because i was like a free agent (laughs) and i was moving to (laughs) la so they were just really sweet and i moved to la and when I got here, I got into this group of friends that were really fun. And um, it was just an amazing group of friends. And they all run this town now. They run Hollywood. Because all my friends in L.A. were, it was this whole group of people from Brown University and from Princeton. And they and we, it was like, they were all writers, producers, actors, directors, and they all became wildly successful. Like every single person mm-hmm. in my group became, I, I could, I, I could say their names, but I'm not going to, but they became hugely successful in their fields. And so we, I was in this kind of really fun, crazy group. And, and it was like, you know, guys, girls, some were gay, some weren't like, it was a mix. I, it was, I was never in like a gay ghetto. Like uh, that wasn't my style. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't like that whole, that mm-hmm. vibe. And, um, yeah. And is this, uh, is this like mid nineties, late nineties? When is yeah, this early two thousands? Okay. okay. Um, and it was just crazy. Like, you know, my friends were, my friend was like, Oh, I'm writing a screenplay. And then suddenly it was like, Oh, like Warner brothers just bought my screenplay. And then my friend's like, Oh, I'm going to write a movie. And you know, it's called, we were at swingers, which is right down the street from me. He's like, yeah, I think we're, I'm going to call the movie swingers. And we were like, oh, what? And then it became like wow. this giant, you know, it became, Doug yeah. directed. Yeah. yeah. So it like, yeah, it's just like that stuff was happening all the time. And so I was always invited to movie premieres and to the Oscars, to the Emmys, the Golden Globes and all the parties and the Hollywood party, like the Vanity Fair parties, the, the governor's ball after the Oscars. Somehow I was just always included in these, in these events and parties. And, um, because I, at the time in the nineties, I was a, I was a, a struggling writer slash actor. So I was, I was doing a ton of commercials <laughs> and um, I was, you know, I, I was doing a lot of commercials, but then not really 
doing well it, in the other side, like TV or movies. I did like a you know a couple indie films, uh, one at Sundance, but then I, but then I ended up becoming a uh, set designer, a production designer for the for the fat in the fashion world. So I did shoots for like mm-hmm. Vanity Fair and and Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, and um. And then all these big, you know, ad campaigns for Gap and Old Navy and Yves Saint Laurent and all these fashion brands. And so, but anyway, meanwhile, I was going to all these parties, having all this fun, like hanging out with, you know, going to Prince's house where he performed for three hours in his backyard, going to Ariana Huffington's house all the time, like for cocktails and mm-hmm. on the West Side in Brentwood and going, you know, having dinner with Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep having going just like constantly going to these fun living the dream la i think i was at a few of those actually you and i might have crossed yeah that. yeah yeah that's we what my have... years in la were like also yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know like going to all these hey, max muchnick's house for a party that he created will and grace and like just the, all this mm-hmm. stuff like was just a, a day a nightly thing for me so i was loving it wow. like i loved my life i thought it was fun and it was also very direct. I was going through, I cycled through five serious boyfriends. I lived with them. And then after, you know, after doing that for a long, a while, I guess from like 93 to 2009, how many years is that? Quick. Wow. That's a lot of years. T- 10, uh, 10, what's nine minus three? 17, 15, 15. 15? I don't know. Okay. Something, something like that. Something like that. Uh, yeah, 17, we, lot, we need John Lennox on. 16, 16 years. 16 years. 16 years. Yeah. yeah. Gosh. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, pathetic. after kind of like <laughs> None of us chasing shiny objects for 16 years, you get a little bored about that. And so I was at Paris Fashion Week in March of 2009. I used to go to Fashion Weeks in New York and Paris I had friends in the, I just, I was, again, one of those things, I was just always invited. I literally had just like an mm. open invitation every season to go if I wanted to. And mm. I, some, a lot of times I didn't go, but I did go a lot. And I was at Paris Fashion Week in March of 2009. I, w- I went to a bunch of the runway shows. Most of the shows have after parties. Some are more extravagant than others. I was at, I think it was Stella McCartney's after party. She's a designer, Paul McCartney's daughter. And I was at at her party at this club called Regine in Paris. And I was sitting with Rachel Zoe and Roger, her husband. Rachel Zoe is like this fashion girl that she used to have her own Bravo show. But I was sitting with them and I was drinking champagne and I was looking out over the crowd and like everyone was there from the fashion world. Kanye was there, like all the, everyone in the, and I, everyone was dancing and having this kind of the time of their life. And it was just like the chic, you know, the chic people. And, um, and I just, I just felt this overwhelming sense of emptiness. Like, mm-hmm. like it, it, ex, it was very unexpected and it was very strong. It was very powerful. I just felt, Like, this cannot be my life. I've done this since high. I mean, I've been doing this since I was 14. I've been going, I've been getting on guest lists of like fabulous clubs, like the Start Club, all blah, blah, blah. Since I was 14, even in Dallas, when I was in high school, I was like always invited to these crazy, I was invited to Saint Tropez, to like friends' houses all the time, like crazy stuff. So I was like, at this point, I was like, I, can't oh and i you know rick owens i don't know if you know who rick owens is the fashion designer Mm -mm. but like you know he lives in paris now he's an american but he's married to michelle lamy and they live he's the reason we all wore those long hem t-shirts ah got it okay so rick owens so i went like for example (laughs) rick owens yeah i was in paris i think this may have been the same wait was this it may have been the same time i'm not sure No, no no it was like no that was before but i was I was invited to Rick Owens' house for Bastille Day, like with Michelle and me. She used to own Café Le Deux and Café Des Artistes in L.A. And, um, like, I went to their house. Like, they're, it's, like, in the center of Paris. They have, like, a five-story beautiful chateau. And it's just, like, that was just, like, my life. But so at Paris Fashion Week in 2009, I just felt like I can't do this anymore. Um. 
you know, I've done everything. I've met everyone. I've traveled the world. I've, I've done it. I like, it was kind of like Peggy Lee. Is that all there is? Like, is that all there is to life? And I always wanted to know the meaning of life. It wasn't like I was oblivious to that, but I just knew that God could never, was never an option for me because I was gay. So I was like, there's no, that's mm -hmm. okay. That's off the table. So I would always look for meaning and purpose in the theater. I would go to these really serious plays in New York and London all the time. Uh, it's so like by Tom Stoppard and Harold Pinter and Eugene O'Neill and Her uh, Tony Kushner really and uh david mamet who's a terrible playwright but um mm. <laughs> so i you know i thought like oh these guys will have they're so smart like they'll definitely i'll figure out the meaning of life through these plays especially tom stopper and i would always go to these plays with all this kind of hope and then i would leave feeling completely empty again because i would just feel like it came so close to the truth like an Ibsen play, like a doll's house. It would say it would come so close to the truth, but then fall apart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I read, you know, so many novels and, you know, Anna Karenina and all these serious like Russian novels I was obsessed with. And, um, and I thought, okay, this will help me figure out what life's all about. And it sort of did Tolstoy. I think Tolstoy was a Christian and there's a character in Anna Karenina named Levin who has a conversion to Christianity and it's a, an amazing, amazing, like 50 page passage in that book. But, um, and so anyway, I was in, so I had this meltdown in Paris, went back to my, uh, hope I had rented an apartment there. So I went back to my apartment in the Marais and I just was up all night about in a panic about my future. I'm like, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Like, I can't go on like this. I mean, I it, like, am I just going to move to Palm Springs and be put out to pasture? Like, uh, you know, every other older gay man, you know, <laughs> cause at that time that was like the rhythm, you know, it's like, yeah. once you kind of age out of, 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 you know, your gay life, like you move to Palm Springs and that's kind of like where you retire <laughs> and uh, you just go to the hunter for the rest of your life. And so, um, <laughs> then, uh, I got back to LA from, from Paris and I got really busy with work again, working on photo shoots. And so I kind of forgot about that night, but it was still on my mind. And, and then six months later, as God would have it, I was at Intelligentsia in Silver Lake, which is a mm -hmm. coffee shop mm -hmm. on sunset. That my friend, my best friend and I used to, that was our weekend kind of rhythm. We would go to Ashe, which is a, a restaurant in Venice uh, on Abbott Kinney. It's no longer there. We used to go to Ashe for brunch, go shopping at Barney's or Fred Siegel in West Hollywood, which is gay church. Shopping and brunch is gay church. And then um, <laughs> we would go to Intelligentsia every weekend. Mm -hmm. And we would just hang out and just kind of like talk to people, whatever. But that particular weekend, we were chatting and then suddenly we see, we look over and we see this table next to us with young people. And there's, they have Bibles, like physical Bibles on the table. Mm -hmm. And we're just like, my friend and I, we had never, ever seen a Bible in LA in public, ever. Like this was like shock. Um, I had never met a Christian in LA. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and by the way, with my friend group in LA, we never once talked about God. We all, we just knew that God, that it was all a myth and we didn't even have to say it. We were, we just were like, Oh God is for those people. Like we don't talk about that. Um, for just to clarify for 16 years, you, the, the subject of God never came, never up. came up. No one, wow. no one ever said, do you believe it? Is there an afterlife? Do you believe? It? No, it was just, we just, it was assumed that it was all a fairy tale and we didn't even wow. have to say it. It was weird. It was like this weird thing unwritten code and um so you can imagine well we'll get to that in a minute but uh so let's see then so we see these people with bibles and my friend kind of loved to sort of engage in 
controversial conversation. So he, he was like, he, he's like, ask them what they're, ask them what's going on. And I, so I was like, no, I don't want to talk to them. And so anyway, we ended up, I ended up turning to them. It's like an evangel, it's a Christian Spanish fantasy come true. It's like an atheist turning to someone <laughs> saying, Hey, what's the gospel? What do you guys believe? <laughs> um, and so that's actually what I did. I turned to them. And I said, what are you guys Christians? What's the deal? And they're like, yeah, we were evangelical Christians. We go to this church in Hollywood called Reality LA on Sunset. Did they they use that term? They called themselves evangelical? Yeah. I think so. so I, mm -hmm. I, I, it came up yeah. at, at a certain point. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I, I mean, I think they may have said our, we go to an evangelical church. Evangelical church. Um, gotcha. So I knew. So then we actually ended up in this conversation for a long time. And I, and I asked. I finally got to the $64,000 question and I said, you know, well, what does your church believe about homosexuality? And they said, well, we believe it's a sin. And I, and I, I the thing, the, the funny thing is, is like, I would have, you know, five years before that or two years before that, I would have just been like, okay, you guys are insane and you need help. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm leaving now. But because of that night in Paris six months before, I was open to hearing that. And I wasn't, I wasn't mm -hmm. shocked that they said that. I, I kind of assumed that's, that was the case. And I had this moment of, what if there is a God? There's a slim chance there's a God. Slim chance. And what if mm -hmm. homosexual behavior is a sin? And what if I've built my entire life on this false foundation and I don't know it? And so... I kind of had this moment of like, okay. And I just accepted what they said. I didn't, I didn't, you know, protest. Uh, and so I just listened. And then they, they invited me to their church the following Sunday. And I said, well, I don't know, honestly, if I'm, I, if I'm going to go, like, can you just give me the address and I'll, I'll think about it. So they gave me the address. I had a week to think it through. And I kind of was the whole week. I was like, Shh, should I do this? It's weird. If I go and people, my friends find out, like I'm, it's, I'm going to be like, they're going to think I'm crazy and it's going to be humiliating. Even though my best friend knew I was maybe going to go, no one else really knew. So it would have been mm -hmm. very weird for people to find out that I was going to an evangelical church. Uh, because, as, you know, we saw the evangelicals as the enemy, you know, that's what, mm -hmm. just like, that's kind of was our, sort of attitude towards evangelical Christians in general. And so for me to go into enemy territory was really strange. And so <laughs> the following Sunday I woke up and I, I was like, I guess I'm going to do this. And I go to reality LA on sunset. I it's in a high school auditorium mm -hmm. and I walk in and there's, it just was crazy. I was like, I, it was my first time at an evangelical church. I was like, I don't even know what to, I don't even know what this is going to be. Like what, I don't know what it's going to be like. And I walk in and there's worship music. The band is playing and I'm like, Oh, Christian music. I forgot about that. That's so weird. It's like, <laughs> but then I was like, no, it's not bad. Actually. It's nice. And, mm -hmm. and then I found my seat. I sat by myself in the front, near the front. The pastor, Tim Chaddock, comes out and he starts preaching on Romans chapter seven. And wow, he was spent, he spent two years in the book of Romans. He, he's an expository mm -hmm. preacher. And so um, he was on Romans chapter seven that day. And uh, he was just preaching for an hour. And while he was preaching, everything, all this stuff started to, to happen. I, every word he was saying was resonating as truth in my mind, in my heart. And I didn't know why. And I was like, what? I was literally on the edge of wow. my seat, riveted to the sermon. And I was, it was the first time in my life I had actually heard and understood the gospel. I was like, wait, this is the gospel? Like it turned everything I thought religion was on its head. And I was like, this is, this is good news. Like this is crazy good news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then after the sermon, I went over to the side of the auditorium. This guy prayed for me. And it was, he was very loving and sweet. And, and it, um, I was like, how does this random straight dude like care about me so much? Mm -hmm. And, and then I walked back to my seat and that's when it all went down. Um, 
It's so I <laughs> so everyone's standing up and singing and worshiping. I sit down because I'm just too freaked out by the sermon, by the prayer, like everything's mm-hmm. freaking. I'm just like in a state. I'm in this state. So, uh, this, as soon as I sit down, and there's 25 more minutes of of worship time. So, mm-hmm. I sit down, and the Holy Spirit just. <sighs> like floods me like God and God just like, it was like Paul when he says, I knew I once knew, I knew a man once who was caught up in the third heaven. It felt like I was caught Mm -hmm. up into heaven for like three seconds. Mm. It was so crazy. It was like a near death experience. And, um, so then I, God in that moment was like, I'm God. Jesus is my son. Heaven is real. Hell is real. The Bible is true. Welcome to my kingdom. And I just Um, immediately burst into tears. mm. Like I've never, ever cried in my life since I was an infant, but I was born again. So I, I, that was, I was a new infant and I was crying. So, so I was doubled over and crying so hard that people around me were starting to get worried about me. They were going to call like a medic. (laughs) I found out later. Wow. And, um, and so the Holy Ghost was on you. <laughs> the Holy Ghost was in the house. So the, yeah. Uh, yeah, Michael and I grew up Pentecostal. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it was it was my the church is reformed, so it wasn't like, it wasn't really like that, but it was yeah. So then I yeah I was just crying for the next twenty five minutes, just crying and crying, and I was it was like Isaiah when he's in the temple and he sees the holiness of God and he comes undone. Like that's what happened to me, and I, it was. Mm-hmm. Mm. not to keep like it was a road to it was like a road to damascus moment it was like so powerful so intense and uh and then i after the service i got i collected myself got in my car drove home i don't even know how i could see i couldn't really see because like, my eyes are just like wow. all of tears but i got home got into bed to take a nap and it happened again a second time like twice in one day God was like, let me show you some more of my glory. And I I just immediately burst into tears again, jumped out of my bed. And I was like, in the middle of my bedroom, I was like, God, you have my whole life. I'm yours. I'm done. And I knew in that moment, I knew that homosexual behavior was wrong. I knew it was sinful. I knew it was no longer part of my life. I knew that dating guys was no longer a part of my future, but I didn't care because I had just met Jesus. And I was like, I'm going with that guy for good riddance to those guys. Like this guy is amazing <laughs> and I'm sticking with him. And I've been, you know, single and I, I would say celibate, but Rosario Butterfield corrected me on that. I've been single and chaste for, for the last 12 years. And so, um, and I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to, I, it, I, it doesn't, I never feel cheated out of anything or like, I don't ever feel like this is unfair that I have to be single. And this is like, or I never, ever have felt that once, not a set for a second, because I have number one, I'm an heir to God, a co-heir with Christ. I have eternal life. I mm-hmm. did the kingdom of God. I, you know, those are kind of, that kind of offsets any sort of suffering uh, or any whatever, not suffering, but whatever it is. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's just been an amazing 12 years. And I, and I have no desire to go back to Egypt, no desire whatsoever. Like, I just don't, I don't want, I don't want that life. I don't want to be a part of it. It's not something I miss at all. And um, yeah, that's kind of it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. At the end. I mean, that would have been, that's an incredible story. Yeah. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. And it's just, I'm so moved by mm-hmm. how God, God literally saved you. Like he showed up yeah. twice in one day and just pulled you out of darkness into light. That would have been quite, I imagine like that, that didn't just affect like your romantic life that had to have had effects on uh, the other aspects of your life too. I mean, career. Oh yeah. Did that how, talk to us about that? Cause there's had to be a cost there. Well, there was, well, there wasn't for a long time, but then there was. So mm-hmm. in terms of career, you know, I, of course could, I was like, you know, the treasure in the fields 
um, what's that? I can't think of the verse, but I, I immediately just on every photo shoot I worked on with actresses and, and pop stars and, you know, Katy Perry and all these in, I was in, you know, Paris Hilton's kitchen evangelizing everyone in on the shoot. You know, I was like, just like, oh my gosh, you guys, Jesus is real. It's crazy. You've got to believe me. <laughs> like, I just, I, I, I didn't care. I was completely fearless because of the Lord. It wasn't wow. me. It was like, God, because of that, how powerful God, and that because of that conversion was so powerful, I, I was utterly fearless. I didn't care who it was. I would just tell them like, Jesus is real. Like, you know, and I would share the gospel with anyone and everyone who would listen. And, um, and so for, it's weird because for a long time I thought, oh, I'm definitely going to get fired. Like I, I'm going right. to, I'm not, I'm going to get canceled or whatever. Canceled wasn't even a thing then, but. Canceled wasn't a thing then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to lose my career because I'm talking too much about Jesus and Christianity. Like I, I can't keep doing this, but I didn't, I didn't care. Like, I just was like, I don't care. And um, what's weird is like, instead of, I actually got more jobs. It was weird. God was like, you know, don't worry. I'm going to provide for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, and then God called me to seminary in 2014, uh, which was really intense. So I went, I, I got my master's at Talbot School of Theology at Biola. And that was a whole another story. Um, but and then. um. It wasn't until my book came out, A Change of Affection, in 2019, that's when kind of it, the, that's when the record stopped. It was like, um, and my, my agent dropped me. <clears throat> and I mean, I, I don't know if they dropped me because of the book, but it was, it was suspiciously <laughs> timed. <laughs> the timing was very, very suspicious. <laughs> So it's, so in other words, it's one thing to, to talk about your faith and you know, on the set and talk to people, but it's another thing to have a book out in the world, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when yeah. in, in print, in print mm -hmm. that it's, it's a different thing. And my, my production design agency is the biggest in the world and they're in, in New York, London, uh, Paris and LA. And so it's just, it would just be really weird for them to have someone on their roster, one of their clients mm. have a book like this out in the world. Mm -hmm. So, and I got, I mean, I, I, I was expecting that and I knew God was leading me into other things. And so, mm. uh, into more full-time ministry stuff and speaking. And so it wasn't a shock to me. Um, but yeah, I did, I did basically get canceled in Hollywood because of my book. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, but have decided to. I mean, you're still living right in the in the middle of it, right in the middle of the city. And yeah, obviously, you still go to church in the city, and you still have friends, I'm sure, right? But what's that been like since? Uh, it's been good. I mean, um, I've you know I've God has done so much stuff. Like, so the book came out, and then I you know I I speak a lot. I speak at churches and conferences around the country. Um, and I have a YouTube show called the Becca cook show. And, and so that I do that weekly and that takes a lot of time and effort and energy. And so that's kind of like, that's sort of, and what else, there's something else. I'm kind of writing a second book now, but, um, what else do I do? <laughs> what else do I do? And so that, so basically I'm in kind of full-time ministry now and, um, mm -hmm. and, my the whole the whole point of my show is is to because it's I believe the lies of the culture for so long in my life, and once God saved me, I knew the truth. I now know the truth. I'm so. My show is all about exposing the lies of the culture and bringing the biblical truth to bear on those lies. And so, mm -hmm. um, so my life. I mean, I lost a lot of friends. Especially I, uh, most of my friends, a lot of old friends of mine were still there for me kind of, but once the book came out, it was like, okay, we're done. Like that, it was really like this weird def defining moment. It was kind of the red line mm -hmm. in the sand. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, Beckett, it was kind of fun for you to talk about this for a while, but like now that right. you've written a book about it, like we're out. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I lost a ton of friends, but I gained. Um, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, but I gain tons of uh, obviously friends in my church. And mm-hmm. now I have this, I have amazing friends, you know, who are Christians and, um, and I sure. still have, you know, I still have some of my old friends and we're in contact and, mm-hmm. but it's different. It's difficult and it's hard because mm-hmm. when you're not on the same page, um, it's difficult to have, because the conversation can only be horizontal. It can never be vertical. So mm-hmm. it's this very kind of limiting experience when I go, when I have like, for example, if I go to dinner with some of my old friends, it's like, we can't really talk about anything real. It's all just right. like yep. kind of chit chat. Yep. And yep. Um, we can't talk about ultimate things. And, um, and they all, everyone knows, you know, they all know I'm a Christian. They all know my, my thing and my story. And, um, and some of them actually two or three, three of my old friends have actually come to Christ. Wow. I was going to ask you that guys have come to Christ, which is, was shocking to me. I was stunned when I found out that these two guys came to Christ, one in New York and one here. Um, but, uh, so it's been, it's been a crazy ride. I mean, I still am just blown away that number one, that God saved me, but number two, God saved me the very first time I went to church. Like that's, that's crazy. And I didn't realize, I thought that, and not always the case. I know. I thought that everyone had the same experience. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But I found out later that they, not everyone did. And Michael's like still kind of, I'm still still trying to figure it out. To be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, (laughs) I'm so thankful that God, like, I love that he just knew that I needed that the first time. Cause like if, right. if nothing had happened that first time, I probably wouldn't have gone back. I mean, obviously God saw her mm-hmm. and he knew before the foundations of the earth, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't have gone back to church. Spoken like a good reformed. Huh? Yeah. Spoken like a good Spoken reformed. Like yeah, a reformed. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm so thankful that God not only saved me, but saved me the first time. And number three, saved me in such a, in, crazy powerful way that was so it, it's just like completely undeniable and mm-hmm. i and i you know i know christians i've heard i know christians struggle sometimes with doubt i've never had a moment of doubt ever about wow. because I, again like i said it was like i was caught up in the third heaven and mm-hmm. you experienced god it was so clear it was just so crystal mm-hmm. clear to me and i Mm-hmm. So there's no, that's also why I'm so um, kind of bold about my faith because I, it just, there's zero doubt in my mind, like what, mm-hmm. who, who God is and that he exists. And I know exactly what I'm doing here. I know exactly what's going to happen to me when I die. I know, mm-hmm. like, I know exactly what's happening and it's crazy. <laughs> Like to have, have that. Have you had subsequent experiences like that, or because that could be on one end really encouraging, but on another end, for some believers who maybe have not had that experience, could be kind of discouraging. Um, and I don't, I don't say that as a critique at all. I'm just asking: Have you ever had subsequent experiences of that, or are you that it, that one experience is just so impressed upon? Oh you no, I've had subsequent is... experiences, many. Um, so okay. I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. So I was at my church. And this was, I don't know when this was, let's say seven years ago, I was at my church and I, after the sermon, I went to the front of the church and I knew that one of the elders was in the service, this guy named Nick. Mm -hmm. And because I walked, I saw, I mean, there's a thousand people in the auditorium. So, but I saw Nick Mm -hmm. and so I, I kind of knew he was there. I mean, I didn't kind of, I knew he was there and after the service, after the sermon, I went to the front, I would usually go to the front of the auditorium and that people can, you can like kneel, like on the, you can kneel and basically just like pray. There's like this Mm -hmm. area where you can just pray. And, um, so I went down there. Us Pentecostals call that an altar. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, we have (laughs) these carpets, we have these carpets at the front, like where you can just go and kind of pray and whatever. Mm -hmm. So, 
Normally, I would go on the side of you. The- go down and pray quietly in our church. Like I'm down, and we push them over. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really how I'm we kidding. do not. I'm kidding. We, we don't push anybody. We don't. We don't, we don't push anybody over. We just whisper to them, "Please fall down. Please fall down. <laughs> fall down <laughs> quick." Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, I uh, so I was praying. Normally, I would go to the side of the church, the, the auditorium, because there's always the prayer. There's people on the prayer ministry that can pray for you for anything you so every sunday i would get prayer every single sunday like i'm like it's free prayer why why i don't understand why there's not lines of people getting prayed for right yes so i would get prayed for every sunday but this particular sunday i was i'm not i wasn't feeling great i just finished a job i was like kind of did i was sleep deprived so i was praying at the front and i literally this is what i said I had never done this before. I was like, God, will you send Nick Tortorici over here to pray for me right now? That's all I said. Five minutes later, I feel a hand on my shoulder and I look up and it's Nick Tortorici. And he's, and I'm like, what you talking about, Willis? I was like, what? Nick, I just prayed for God to send you over here. And he's like, yeah, the Lord told me to come pray for you. I'm like, what? Like, that's crazy. He's like, yeah, he told me to come pray for you. And, um, and so that happened. Um, another thing happened. There's so many more, but I'll just give you one more example. Um, and it was with Nick again. So before I was a Christian, I, I had struggled with mild depression, my, my, since high school. And it was always this kind of morning depression. And it was pretty, it was pretty, I know it was really annoying because it was, uh, it was, it was intense in the morning. And so before, like 10 years before I became a Christian, I finally got on an antidepressant and I, and it was amazing. It like kicked out the depression completely. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, but I, but after I got saved, I was like, I don't think I need this anymore. So I stopped taking it. I went to my psychiatrist who was gay and Brent Wood guy. And I, he's like, I'd like, I want to get off the Wellbutrin. Uh, and he's like, oh, that's wonderful news. May I ask why? I was like, well, I met Jesus and, and now blah, blah, blah. He's like, hmm. he's like, why don't we keep you on for six more months? And um, I was like, no, no, no. no. Up that dosage. You're going to go ahead and up that dosage, right? I was like, no, I'm getting off now. And so I, I got off of the Wellbutrin because you don't have to wean off of it. You can just stop. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, ask your doctor. Don't, 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 don't listen to me. Anyway, <laughs> you're not giving medical no, advice no, right no, no. now. <laughs> this is not the Joe Rogan podcast. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Where's Doctor Malone? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, um, so uh, I got off the Wellbutrin, and then a couple months later, that depression came back, and I was like, "Ah, oh, dang! I thought this was gone. Like it's back." I could easily get back on the medication, but I kind of don't want to. So once again, at church, this is where everything happens. That's why the body of Christ is so important. That's come on. All the stuff happens. All the good stuff happens. Go to church. Go to (laughs) church. You cannot stay at home and watch church. Like you got your go to C three LA. Do not forsake the gathering together, the assembly. (laughs) Yeah, Hebrews. Um, (laughs) and so, uh. Why is it? So I go to Nick. Nick is on the side of the church praying for people. Uh, after the sermon, I go up to him and I tell him the story. And he's like, okay, let me pray for you. It was total right out of James chapter five. Go to one of the elders, have them lay hands on you, anoint you with oil, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Exactly what he did. He laid hands on me. He prayed for me about this depression thing. And then he anointed me with oil. And when he did that, I'm not kidding you. I felt this tingling sensation rise up out Mm -hmm. of my body through my head and just like immediately burst into tears. And it was like gone. The depression was just like, boom, gone permanently. And I, and I, and Nick, after he finished praying, I was like, Nick, I think I just got healed. Of depression, and wow. he was like, "I, I, yeah." He's like, "I know. I could feel the Holy Spirit moving in you." And I'm like, "What?" 
<laughs> so, Nick, Nick sounds very unimpressed about yeah. the I know, right? He is. Yeah. He's, he's I want Nick to come. Nick, can Nick come pray for me? I know. I know. He's been on my show. This sounds awfully Pentecostal. Yeah. This Beckett. does sound Pentecostal. Quite Pentecostal. Uh, no, it's we're, just, we're like, joking it's because just Holy Spirit. You know, it's the Holy Spirit. Yes, moving. exactly. It's gifts of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. We're, we're pseudo joking. We're, we're no, I know. So ourselves. anyway, so I've had many, many more experiences like that. So, so my faith is constantly being just re uh, ignite, not reignited, but just I'm constantly being encouraged by God. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many times, just even a few weeks ago, I got prayed for at church by uh, someone on the prayer team. And it was just one of those moments where I, I felt like God was like, you need to go get prayer. And I was like, I don't want to do this today. God, <laughs> he's like, just go get prayed for. And I did. And I was like, okay. So I went up to this person and she prayed for me. And while she was praying for me, I just felt the Holy spirit, just like, like my heart just like melted. And I was like, Oh yeah, I needed, I needed to do this. So I feel God's presence a lot and I feel very connected to him. Uh, and so, yeah, I, well, I forgot the, what the question was, but the, well, I think it's just like for anybody who, no, it's great for anybody who maybe hasn't had any of those experiences. Um, I think number one, sometimes we limit God and I don't mean that in, you know, a sense that we undermine his sovereignty, but maybe we limit uh, the experiences that are available to us by just not even believing that God wants us to experience him mm. simply in disobeying the prompt that we feel to go up and receive prayer yeah. or uh, disobeying the prompt to just be in church that day so that someone like Nick can come and lay hands on us and mm -hmm. anoint us with oil. Um, and so I would just encourage people just pr practice what the scriptures teach in terms of just spiritual disciplines. And my experience is that you will experience God. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe that too. I think the more you practice the spiritual disciplines, the more you do sense his presence, the more you, you feel, because it's a relationship, you know, it's like, the, it's like having, you know, I don't need to give you this illustration, but it's like a w husband and wife. It's like the more time you spend with your wife, the closer you're going to feel with her. But if you mm -hmm. don't spend any time with her, you're not going to, you're not mm -hmm. going to really, right. you know, feel the, uh, that much. Yeah. So it's, that's, mm -hmm. that's it. I want to um, shift gears a little bit. If you've got just a, a touch more time, um, uh, if you need to go hang out with Paris Hilton or something <laughs> like that, we totally understand. <laughs> that's hot. Uh, uh, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to shift gears a little bit because you mentioned earlier um, combating the lies of the culture. Uh, I saw on your podcast recently that you did, that you read and did um, some breakdown of uh, Carl Truman's book, The Rising Triumph of the Modern He's Self. coming on my show soon. Yeah. Oh, could you, you send him our way? Could you tell him that we yeah. want to have him? On yeah, we're emailing him about every you know eight days at this point. Michael, I love that book. Yeah, so uh, I know that book um, is amazing. Yeah. So, but I wanted to ask you about when it comes to combating the lies of the culture. Can you expound upon that a little bit? What are some of those lies? Um, uh, the reason I bring up Carl Truman's book, because I just assume that you have those kinds of things in mind. But can you just talk to us a little bit about that? This can be a kind of a, a tough subject for Christians to engage in because they just don't know how to do it. Um, or maybe they're just afraid of being really offensive, you know, should they try to engage in some of the modern day conversation yeah. about sex ethic? I mean, obviously, one of the biggest lies of the culture is kind of rooted in the sexual revolution. Uh, and so it's like kind of, sex is uh, sex is no big deal it's just a transaction it doesn't really affect anything and um but it's like that's such a like because um i just actually had natasha crane on we talked about she just wrote a book about this but um yeah there's so the lie this the, particularly the the sexual lies even about homosexuality that i mean that's one of the biggest lies that's satan's like huge masterpiece and he's got the entire culture duped and he's got people in the church fooled and he by the way mm -hmm. satan is thrilled i mean he's like laughing all the way to the bank he's thrilled that he's got churches who are gay or becoming gay affirming or not really knowing mm -hmm. and kind of like well we don't really know 
It's like, yeah, mm-hmm. no, it's actually pretty. Cl- it's very clear. I have two episodes on mm-hmm. the exegetical thing in the Bible, but about this issue, but mm-hmm. um, that that lie in particular is very destructive because I first of all I lived that life for twenty years, and I know how dark it is, mm-hmm. and I know that. And, and and by the way, I mean, Paul talks about this in Romans 1. He starts off the chapter talking about suppressing the truth. And by the end of the chapter, what what example does he give of suppression of the truth? Homosexual behavior. Yeah, the, and why does he do yeah. that? Because it's obvious anatomically, physiologi- physiologically, and psychologically that men and a man and a woman are supposed to go together. So... It takes a lot of suppression to not believe that. Mm. And um, it's kind of the same thing with abortion. Like it, I, if Paul were alive today, I think he would use abortion as the illustration of suppressing, suppressing mm. the truth. Because we all know, even when I was, you know, pro, I was super pro-choice back in the day. And all my friends mm-hmm. were obviously pro-choice. And, and I, but, but it's like, I, it was like, I knew deep down that it was a baby. Right. You're practicing like so much cognitive dissonance. Yes, it's such cognitive dis- disson- dissonance that it's like you have to actively suppress the truth. And in fact, when I was living as a gay man, I knew deep, I, I mean, I, I would never have really said this out loud, but I think I knew deep, deep down that there was something off about it. And I couldn't, I didn't really know how to explain it or articulate it, but, but yeah, that the, the, the lies. So just like every TV show, every movie, every, everything is all about pushing this kind of like sexual, be who you are, be, you know, be gay, like be celebrate your like gay pride month. And, and it's like, those those lies are so destructive, not only temporally but eternally destructive, and um mm-hmm. and so that's why I try because you know God, <laughs> I always say that Satan you know twisted God's word in the garden. He said, "Did God really say that you can't do this?" Mm-hmm. And he's doing the same thing with this lie with with homosexual behavior. He's like mm-hmm. he's like even to Christians, he's like, well, did God really say, is it really clear? Because, you know, Mm -hmm. that was just Paul talking in his day, blah, 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 all the lies, all the lies, Mm -hmm. the revisionist lies. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, um, on the show, I, it's not just sexuality, but it's other things on my show that I try to address in the culture. Um, all just secular lies, secular humanism, um, just all the kind of lies that come out of that worldview. And, and I try to kind of shine the light on it literally with the, with the word of God and say, no, 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 these, these are the lies that I used to believe. And now Mm -hmm. I understand that they are their lies and, and they're, this is not the truth. And so that's, I mean, I trying to think of more examples, but that's kind of, um, I remember that you talked a bit about, um, you connected back when you were talking about Carl Truman's book about um, the link to Freud, the link to Marx, the link to Darwin. Rousseau. Yeah, yeah so John Rousseau. Jacques Rousseau basically is next to Adam and Eve. He is the most, his philosophy, I think, is the most destructive thing that's ever happened to humans since Adam and Eve, mm-hmm. well, since what they did. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. Rousseau, as you know, Rousseau, the in the 18th century he his philosophy was man is born good but is corrupted by society so society uh, mm-hmm. so he's famous at least for he's famous for saying man is born uh man is born free. free but everywhere in chains meaning the noble savage the man in nature in capital in nature <laughs> is good by nature but what corrupts him is entering into society and having to um lose his authenticity and become uh and 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 live by the mores of that society mm-hmm. and so that's that's really so you can see and he inspired marx he inspired, inspired marx he inspired and, and he and he was the right. progenitor of the french revolution which was absolute right. chaos and mayhem because mm-hmm. of his philosophy mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the jacobins and robespierre they all like ended up 
killing themselves or dying by mm-hmm. guillotine, killing each other. And um, in the reign of terror and all that. <clears throat> and then, yeah, he mm-hmm. led and that philosophy led to Marx and that led to all kinds of communism, destructive uh, isms in the 20th century that killed m- m- hundreds of millions, hundred millions. and something millions mm-hmm. of people. Mm-hmm. And so Rousseau, the, the, the but, problem with yeah. Rousseau is the Rousseau is the opposite of the Bible because the, the Bible tells us that we're born in sin. We're born with this original sin. And right. Uh, and when, when someone come, when someone comes along like Rousseau and says, no, you're actually born good, but it's, you're corrupted mm-hmm. by society. Then that flips everything. Like it just flips mm-hmm. every single aspect of culture. And we're mm-hmm. seeing that today where there's mm-hmm. no, everyone's a victim. There's no one can be blamed for what they do because they're just mm-hmm. corrupted by society. And so it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's our job as society or the government's job to correct that problem as opposed to that person <laughs> taking responsibility for responsibility, his own Responsibility, yeah. And so mm-hmm. that's, that's how destructive, and we see it all around us now. It's every theory, critical race theory, all these things are, are come from Rousseau. Keep unpacking that a little bit because I think you're, you're definitely engaging with people right now who are listening, but I think they have more questions as to how that unravels. So like, an example would be heteronormative uh, belief in pervading culture. If you were to play out Rousseau, he would see that as a as an oppressive social structure upon the individual that they need to that is a chain that they are wearing that they need to break free from. Yeah, is that yeah, right? because uh, because you're what you're doing is you're taking away that person's authenticity who they mm-hmm. you're you're mm-hmm. you're imposing your kind of moral grid on them mm-hmm. your moral mm-hmm. code or mores on that person and that's what's really damaging is is imposing that on them uh because they are no longer able to live their authentic that's why this whole idea of that the catch word of the day is authenticity and there's a reason why mm-hmm. that's the case. And it all, again, it goes back to Rousseau. And mm-hmm. uh, because every there, and, and uh, Carl Truman talks about this, and um, who else does? But anyway, it's about this kind of radical uh, individual uh, individualism. individualism. Yeah, right. And yeah, so we live yeah. in this world where it's all about, it, we filter reality, we filter the truth through our feelings rather than through any mm-hmm. objective outside mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Per- person or agent. And so mm-hmm. when we do that, when we, when we live in, we live in a postmodern world, there's no, everything's subjective, even language is subjective. So there's no right or wrong. There's no tr- truth. Everyone has their own, his own version of truth. And so no one, we can, there's no consensus. And so when, when someone says, oh, you're harming me or that your speech is harming me, it's like, well, first of all, you have to define what harm is. Harm. Um, mm-hmm. Because when I say, for example, let's, let's be concrete about this. When I say, that homosexual behavior is destructive again, not only temporally, but eternally. A, many, many people in society, in our culture would say I'm har- I'm harming them by saying those words. What I'm actually doing is loving them because, and that's, by the way, that's my only motivation to say that is love. I don't, mm-hmm. All I care about are people's eternal destinies. I don't care. Uh, and in fact, in Leviticus 19, look what it says about. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17, it says this, this kind of gets to the heart of what I'm saying right now. It says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. In other words, telling the truth is loving your neighbor. Obviously doing it in love is, is very important, but telling the truth is loving your neighbor. And, and Paul brings that into the new Testament. I think of, uh, 
First Corinthians five, where he talks about dealing with sexual immorality in the church and how he's not shy to confront it uh, for for the same purpose that Le- Leviticus nineteen points out, lest you incur sin, because uh, sin has an effect on us when we tolerate it. Um, oftentimes we end up. Yeah, he wanted to hand that guy. He handed the ourselves. guy over. He told him to hand that guy over to Satan, who was sleeping with his stepmother. <laughs> and it's and, right. but but why? Which was yeah. Paul does that because he well, wants say, to, and to be him. clear. That was his. He's got to say his goal is restoration. Yeah, and, and the reason I bring that example up is because you know immediately when you say Leviticus, people are going to go, oh well, that's the law, so it has no Im- impact. But I always want to just help people see the proper relationship between law and gospel, and Paul and you know, the other apostles, Jesus himself, call upon the law all the time to help us understand how to live. Yeah. Uh, so I forgot where I was going with that. Or what? Your motivation. Uh, yeah, my motivation is, 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 is truly, it really is love. Like I, because once you've met the king of the universe, and once you're in a relationship with them, all you want is to tell other people. It's like, you know, it's like, I mean, there are verses about this in the Bible, but it, but there, it's like seeing the like the most amazing movie ever, and just like, oh, telling your friends, you guys have to see this movie. It's amazing, and that's, mm-hmm. I mean, it's infinitely more so in this case with God, with Christ. But, mm-hmm. um, that's truly what motivates me that's what gets me out of bed every day and that's why i do my show that's why i i go speak to people all the time is because i i just want to make it just it's like this yearning in me to just like guys please understand the truth this is so important like this has eternal consequences like this all these issues like these have eternal consequences and the gospel is the answer to all of this and that's why I do the, the things I do. And I spend, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like Paul was single and all he cared, he was beaten and shipwrecked and thrown in prison. I'm not saying I'm Paul, but he was beaten, shipwrecked, thrown in prison. And uh, all he cared about was getting the gospel out or around the Mediterranean. Like that's all he cared about. And cause he knew he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he was like, okay, like this is what I'm going to do. And that's all I care about. I care about people, people's salvation and their eternal life and their eternal destiny. And, uh, and that's, yeah, that's why I talk about these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's important to always understand and, and just help people draw connections to the fact that the social imagination is informed by the thinkers of our past and oftentimes what we might consider, you know, more liberal or progressive thinking is rooted in centuries old ideas. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we're not, we're not as free as we think we are, you know, when we proclaim how liberated we are sexually or, or whatever else. And I think it's just important that people recognize that. Yeah, I was so in that bondage. they can just have an honest conversation with themselves. Yeah, I thought I was sexually liberated for twenty years, but I little did I know I was I was in bondage for all those years. I wasn't truly free. You were in bondage to Russo. Mm-hmm. 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 Yep, that's really good. And anything else you can think of, question wise? No. Is there anything that you think Christians are are too focused on, and then something you think Christians aren't focused on enough? Um, I think. I think. Christian leaders and pastors are not focused enough on sexuality because especially homosexuality, because it's such a, ta- it's so taboo. I mean, it's so uh, controversial and, and what happens is when you don't talk about this from the pulpit, when you don't talk about homosexual behavior from the pulpit as a sin, um, that, and you don't do it for years Set, that's a that's the perfect opportunity for Satan to creep into the church, sow doubt among the sheep, and and then suddenly you wake up one day, ten years later, and half of your church thinks that 
is thinks that being you know living a homosexual life is not only good but something to be celebrated and you know even it's it's become a sacrament now so that's that's something mm-hmm. i and i know i know it's not easy for pastors to talk about this but cuz they're you know obviously they're going to get a lot of pushback but uh it's so crucial to talk about it and not and not just like okay we're going to do a conference and we're going to talk about this one day every 10 years it's like no just talk about it as you would anything make it part else of the regular in a, conversation in your sermon. make it normative just like mention oh yeah, yeah by the way like sexual sin or give an ex- an illustration of like oh this was yeah. a sin there blah blah, blah. like mm-hmm. so that is something i don't think is talked about enough because the culture has taken over like <laughs> the culture is mm-hmm. the culture is satan is winning this battle he's winning He's got so many people blinded and uh, he's not going to win the war, but he's winning this battle. And um, so I, I think it's, it's very important to make it very crystal clear to, to people that in the church that guys like, and it's not because it's not because this, this sin is, I talk about this in my book, this sin is the same but different it's the same as other sexual sins but it's very different because there's gay pride parades there's not adultery pride parades or there's not greed right. pride parades so it's become so wrapped up in identity it's very difficult right. to untangle in fact the holy spirit is the only person who can untangle it in a person which again probably comes back to the fact that there's a sense of liberation right that there's an oppression that's been upon this quote class of people yeah and so it needs its own parade whereas no one's going around saying that adulterers are oppressed yeah exactly so right. it's uh so i think that's one thing that's not talked about enough uh, even though i talk about it all the time <laughs> it's not about these rules like i i don't it's not rule i find so much joy in obedience i mm-hmm. i love mm-hmm. finally because as i said when i lived in this postmodern world with no right or wrong no up or down i was in a constant state of anxiety. But now that I know the truth, mm-hmm. now that I know what God's design is for human sexuality, human flourishing, I find so much joy in obedience. I, I find joy in having a father, a heavenly father who sets boundaries for me as a, a little kid needs boundaries. And a, a little boy feels safe when his parents give him boundaries. He feels safe and protected. Mm-hmm. And I, that's mm-hmm. how I feel now. I feel so protected. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Before when I was living as a gay man, I, I was, who there was all kinds of crazy things going on. I could have been like, so many things could have happened, but I, now I feel so safe, so protected. And I love being obedient to Christ. I love it. I don't find it. I don't find it. Uh, a burden at all. In fact, I find mm-hmm. the opposite. I find it a joy. Mm-hmm. Amen. Mm. Becca amazing. Cook. Yeah. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you so much. Where can people find you online? Obviously your YouTube channel. Yeah. Instagram. The Becca Cook show on YouTube. And it's also on all the podcast platforms. And then uh, BeccaCook.com is, they can find me there. Cool. Wonderful. Amazing. Becca, thanks so much for being with us today, man. Thank Appreciate you guys for you. having me. We have to hang out at Absolutely. Intelligentsia now. <laughs>